So please turn to the book of uh, Nahum, chapter 1. I, th- I thought today I'd, I'd pick a, um, a, a book of the Bible that's not that popular because the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So rather than just preach from one of the more common uh, Bible, uh, Bible books, I thought we would go with Nahum and just see what we can find in the book of Nahum that would be profitable for us today for doctrine and for reproof, for correction and for instruction. I promise I won't preach for too long this afternoon, so I'll try and keep it a bit shorter. So if you're, if you're there, if you can turn to Nahum chapter 1, we'll start at verse 1, and it says there in verse 1, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the El- Elkishite. So the title of my sermon this afternoon is The Burden of Nineveh. The Burden of Nineveh. And verse 2 says there, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord would take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. So what I want to do today is take away a few points from the book of Nahum. We won't go through every verse, but just cherry pick a few verses and focus on those. So the, the first point I want to talk about today is that God has enemies. God has enemies. A lot of people might find that hard to, to reconcile with what they've heard about God, but God actually has people which he considers to be his enemy. And Nineveh, this generation of Nineveh, had become God's enemies. You might recall that 150 years earlier in the book of Jonah, they actually received the word of God. And I believe because they had so much light in a previous generation, and now they've moved away from that and they've rejected the word of God, that's why God says here that he is furious, because they've, they've turned away from the light that they, had, they once had, and now God's furious it's not, it's not like they never had the gospel. They did have the word of God through Jonah and now they've turned away, so God is furious. So let's have a look at Jonah chapter 3. So let's just jump back and recap of what happened 150 years ago and let's have a look at how they did receive the word of God from the prophet Jonah. So if you can turn to Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, so that's two books to the left in your Bibles. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Let's have a look at how they did receive the word of God says there, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Look, I just love the response of this city, Nineveh, because at this time, Nineveh was like the world power, the biggest city in the world at that time. And the king, he just received the word of God from the prophet. He could have just had him put to death, clicked his fingers, had him put to death, because Jonah's walked into the city and done a day's journey, and then he started preaching against the city, and he could have very easily had him put to death. And even the people, verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. That is just a great response to the preaching of God's word. And he, and this picked it up again in verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree, decree of the king and his nobles, saying that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Like, I just love the attitude of this king. Like, he's taking no chances, covering all the bases. Even your cattle are going to be fasting and in sackcloth. And he cried mightily unto God, Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So we can see there's a, an amazing change of heart in the people of Nineveh, and it so impressed God that God even repented of the harm that he was going to do. So we can see that generation embraced the prophet, embraced the word of God as preached by Jonah. So turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. And I believe that generation in Nineveh got saved. For the most part, they received the word of God and were saved. 
So it's interesting it says that the people believed the word spoken by Jonah. So I believe that generation received the word of God and are saved. So Matthew 12 and verse 39. Matthew 12, 39 says, this is Jesus speaking, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall, be, there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah's. For as Jonah's was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So the generation that Jesus was preaching to, for the most part, they rejected Jesus. Whereas Nineveh, they actually received Jonah and believed his word. So that generation is going to rise up and condemn the generation that rejected Jesus. Because they can say, well, we, we accepted Noah, and you guys have rejected the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, and then they can just condemn that generation. So I believe that's why they were saved. It's also interesting that Jonah's very life was like a demonstration of the gospel. You know how he has three, three days and three nights in the well's belly. So I wouldn't be surprised if Jonah had some deep revelation regarding the gospel and, and Jesus dying, being in, in the heart of the earth in hell for three days and rising from the dead. And it doesn't say too much about what Jonah preached to, um, to Nineveh, but Jesus says here that there was the preaching that Jonas did do. So he may well have gone on and articulated the gospel, got them saved, and, um, and they've gone on to serve God. But 150 years later, it's not the case. And notice there that, that the pro a prophet doesn't get sent the second time to Nineveh. Like they've had their day of vis visitation and they received the prophet of God when they had the chance. But where they failed was to then pass down that teaching to the future generations. And that's a warning for us. Like how often do you see a, a solid KJV only Bible preaching, soul winning church, but then generations down the track, they become watered down. And that's where we need to learn from, from Nineveh and make sure that we just keep being diligent, keep preaching the foundations to our children. That's why it's so great that we've got um, uh, Brother Nicholas and Brother Caleb coming through the leadership training because we're passing down the gospel and the word of God to future generations because we don't want to end up like Nineveh in, a, in 150 years' time being rejected by God as a false church. And that we need to be diligent to ensure that happens. Um, and this is reminding me a little bit about soul winning. Just like God sent Jonah to Nineveh to give them the word of God, like when we go knock on someone's door, it's like God has then sent a prophet to that person's house. And then a lot of onus then comes back on that, on that house. Because not everybody gets a prophet sent to their door, to knock on their door to give them the word of God. Just like Nineveh was destined at that time for the fires of God's judgment and they, they were able to be saved from that by receiving the word from Jonah, that person behind that door, they're on their way to the lake of fire. And God sends a prophet to that door to tell them to repent and believe the gospel. And if they repent and believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, fantastic. But if they don't, and that's a very serious thing. When they've had the word of God delivered to them very clearly, a prophet has been sent by God to that person. And I say a prophet not because we believe like we're Old Testament prophets, but because we have the word of God, we can give them God's very words like a prophet does. And if they reject that word, then that can then fast track them to becoming a reprobate. That's a scary thing, especially then after they've been given the clear gospel and then they still choose to believe something false like you have to repent of your sins to be saved or you can lose your salvation or a trust in a false religion, then that can fast track them to becoming a reprobate and that's something very scary. And Nineveh, they had crossed the line. By this stage, 150 years later, I believe that they had become a reprobate city. They had crossed the line. So have a look at Romans chapter 1 and we will be back to Nineveh chapter 1. But for now, turn to... Romans chapter 1, at verse 19, I just want to show you how they had become a reprobate city. Romans 1 and verse 19, it says there, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So I guess we can agree that Nineveh had been shown the truth of God's word by the preaching of Jonah, and they had received it in that generation. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now have a look at verse 21, and we're going to see how it applies to Nineveh. 
because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 150 years later, they no longer knew the Lord. But once they, they, they did know the Lord once, but then 150 years later, they no longer did know the Lord. And it's interesting there that in, in verse 21, it says their imaginations became vain. So have a look at Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9. So Nahum chapter 1, verse 9. And it says there about Nineveh that what do you imagine against the Lord? So you see the connection there to the imagination. That the imagination as a, as a city had become darkened and they were like imagining false things against the Lord. So just like in verse 21, they had turned away from the true gospel message and they had become vain in their imaginations and they imagined vain things against the Lord. So they still had knowledge of the Lord, but this time they were imagining the wrong things against the Lord. And that's a symptom of being a reprobate. And have a look at the rest of the verse there. It says, And he will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up a second time. And I believe because they were re rejected by God, because they were reprobate, because they were imagining the wrong things at this stage against the Lord, that, he was done, that they were done for and that he was going to strike them so hard that he would not have to strike them a second time. He wouldn't have to rise up a second time and afflict them because they were going to be done for. And that's a scary thing there. If, if someone's been given the true gospel and they understand it, they understand about Jesus being the Son of God and all those sort of things that do with the, um, the gospel, and then they reject that and they believe something else and they imagine something else against the Lord instead of what's clearly taught in the scriptures, I think that's a that's a scary thing. That's a sign that that person may be, may be a reprobate because they've rejected the truth and now they're believing something false when they've been clearly presented the gospel. They clearly understand the gospel, yet but now they reject that, they're imagining something false and that's a scary thing. So have a look at um, Nahum chapter 3 and verse 1. And let's have a look at the sort of sins that were going on in Nineveh at this particular time. And what made God so furious against that city? So we can see there that as well as rejecting the Lord, they were also doing these wicked sins. It says there in verse 1 of Nahum chapter 3, Woe to the bloody city, it is all full of lies and robbery. So the first sin that's mentioned is lies. So we already, already read in the, um, in the Bible in the previous sermon that lies are an abomination to God. It's full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not, the noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses and there is none end of their corpses. So there's a lot of murder going on, a lot of dead bodies about the city. They stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of their whoredoms. So there's a lot of um, uh, wicked sexual sins going on. Of the well-favoured harlots, so there's prostitutes in the city. The mistress of witchcraft, so there's a lot of witchcraft and black magic, all that sort of stuff going on. That selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. So a lot of wicked sins going on in the city at that time. And it's because of these sins that God has reserved wrath for that city. They're done for, it's too late. All they have to look forward to is God's wrath. And one, once upon a time, Nineveh displayed God's mercy. It was an example of God's abundant mercy, but now they were just going to be an example of God's wrath. Let me just read to you Romans 9.22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? So at this point... Nineveh is a, wrath, is a vessel fitted to wrath. That was the first point I want to talk about, how it was God, that God does have enemies and Nineveh had become God's enemy, unfortunately, at that point, which is about 615 BC is what, when they say this happened. And the history books will say about 612 BC is when the Babylonians actually ransacked and took over Nineveh. The second point I want to make is that God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. So still in chapter 1, verse 2 there, it says God is jealous. God is jealous. So if you can turn to Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24, verse 19. Joshua 24, verse 19. 
And let me read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 23 while you're turning there. It says there, Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God. So Nineveh, they had forgotten what, what Jonah preached to them, which he made with you and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God, even a jealous God. So God is jealous over his people. God is jealous over his people. And because Nineveh once had God's word and they rejected it, God was then jealous over them and he punished them. And we can see a similar warning to the people of Israel in Joshua chapter 24. Now I only came across this verse this morning in my Bible reading and it just tied in so well with, this, with the message tonight, or this afternoon. Let me read it to you there. So this is just after they've come out of the, the, um, out of the wilderness and they've um, conquered all the nations in the promised land and Joshua is just about to die so he's giving his last exhortation to the people saying that you need to serve God and all these sort of things and the people said well we are going to serve God no problem but then Joshua says in verse 19 and Joshua said unto the people you cannot serve the Lord for he is an, he is an holy God he is jealous he's a jealous God and would not forgive your, trespass, your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he have done you good. So Israel had, had, had much good done to them by God, just like Nineveh did. But he's saying, if you turn away, you're not, your sins aren't going to be forgiven. And that's what happened as a city to, to Nineveh. So this is not talking about personal salvation. It's talking about a nation. And then you can apply it to the city of Nineveh that they, they once had God do them good. But now because God's holy, well, he's not going to just turn a blind eye to their wicked sins that they're doing at this point. And that's, that's something that we need to take heart as well, that God is a jealous God over us because we're, we're his temple. Yeah. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So we need to realise that God's going to be jealous over us because we're his temple and we don't want to engage in the wicked sins because he's going to then deal with us. And that's the warning that we can take from Nineveh and from the children of Israel, that God is jealous over us. So that was my second point. My third point I want to make is the Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is slow to anger. So in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3 this time, have a read there. It says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord have his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Thank God that the Lord is slow to anger. Like we, we might want to see God be quick to punish the wicked, but that's where God's different to us. He is actually very slow to anger, it seems. Like it took 150 years before God would bring the hammer down on Nineveh, and he is very slow to anger. If you can turn to Psalm 103, Psalm 103, verse 8. And while you're turning there, let me read to you from Joel chapter 2 and verse 3. It says there, And rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repent of him of the evil. Because he's, so, he's, he's great in mercy, that means he's also slow to anger. And if, like Nineveh was an example of, of Joel chapter 2, verse 3, they, were, they rented their heart, not just their garments, and they repented, and God was slow to anger, and God repented him of the evil that he was going to do against that city. Let's have a look at Psalms 103, verse 8. It says there, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He have not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our inequities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far have he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame and remembereth that we are dust. So God is very gracious and merciful to us. And if it wasn't for God's mercy, 
and it wasn't for the fact that God is slow to anger, then none of us would be saved today because we've all done sins in our past which would have been, which would have been just if God had then killed us for those sins because sins are, are wicked before God. But God, because he's slow in anger, he hasn't done that. He's kept us alive. His mercy has been abundant towards us and here we are today saved. And then I read to you from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. So because he's rich in mercy, we've been saved today and had the opportunity to not die in our sins. He's kept us alive. His anger hasn't been quick against us, but his mercy has been abundant. And here we are today saved because God's merciful. I guess we need to be mindful of that and just... Remember that God's been merciful to us. We also ought to be merciful to other people as well. And my next takeaway point is that he will not at all acquit the wicked. He will not at all acquit the wicked. So even though he's slow to anger and great in mercy, he's still not going to acquit the wicked. It says there at the end there of verse 3 of Nahum chapter 1, oh, in the middle there it says, And will not at all acquit the wicked, the Lord have his way etc etc and that gives us a lot of comfort because if you see wicked people do wicked things to other people or you may have had wicked things done unto you it's a comfort to know that God's promise that he's not going to acquit the wicked they're going to get what's coming to them look they may commit suicide or something like that to escape the law but and then people can be distraught and upset like we sometimes Aaron and I will watch crime documentaries and someone gets busted for being a serial killer or some wicked sin and they'll commit suicide thinking they've, they've got, got away with it and the people the victims will be like upset and distraught that this person's escaped judgment but if you're saved if you understand god's word that gives you comfort knowing god's going to get them god's going to get them and they're not they're not going to get away with it and god would not acquit the wicked let me read to you from romans 12 uh, verse 19 dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So if, if you see someone's done something wicked to you, you can make room for God's wrath. You can expect God's wrath to come upon that person. And you can even pray, God, kill that person, bring your wrath down on that person, because by, by, you, by you're making actually room in your life for that person to be judged. So you can accept that God's going to judge that person, and that gives you some peace. Because you know God's not going to acquit the wicked, but you don't need to take it into your own hands but you can give place to wrath. You can give place to God knowing that he is going to repay. Therefore, if by an enemy hunger, feed him. If he first give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So it's a comfort to know that God's going to get the wicked. He's going to make sure they get what's coming to them. And that's, that's a comfort to those that have been victims of these sort of people. And the next point I want to look at is that we need to preach the gospel. We need to preach the gospel. It's interesting in the, monk, in, in the midst of um, the book of Nahum where it's about the burden of Nineveh, the destruction that's going to come against Nineveh, we see the preaching of the gospel. Have a look there in verse 14 of Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1, verse 14. And the Lord have given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for they are vile. And verse 15. Behold, upon the mountains of the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. So in verse 15 there we see, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that, published, that bringeth good tidings. That's the preaching of the gospel. Let me compare that to uh, Isaiah 52 verse 6. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold it is I. And verse 7, How beautiful upon the, the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace and bring good tidings of good that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Lie God reigneth. So we see the preaching of the gospel. 
And again, that's also repeated in Romans chapter 10, which is one of my favourite soul winning verses. Let me just read that to you as well. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So even in a small minor prophet of the book of Nahum, there's the preaching of the gospel. And it's one of the most famous chapters or verses that's uh, referenced in, in the New Testament about preaching the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. And that's referenced in Isaiah and also in Nahum. So we can see the preaching of the gospel there. And it's, all, it's, all, it's also interesting that whenever the Bible in the New Testament talks about reprobates, there's always the preaching of the gospel tied in there. So in Romans chapter 1, just before Paul teaches about the reprobate doctrine, he's talking about how he preaches the gospel. He says, um, let me quickly read it to you there. Because the preaching of the gospel is always the answer to the reprobate doctrine. So Paul said there, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he goes on to talk about the reprobate. So there's always the preaching of the gospel connected with the reprobate doctrine. And in Nahum we see the reprobate city of, of, of Nineveh getting judged by God. It, 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 yet there's also the gospel being proclaimed. This is, Behold the feet of those on the mountains preaching the gospel. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's another chapter about the reprobates. And very similar to Romans chapter 1 where it talks about all the, the sins of these people and it says they're reprobate concerning the faith. But then in chapter 4, you have the preaching of the gospel. So let me just read that to you. It's 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you want to turn there for this one, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And again, you see the preaching of the gospel associated with the reprobates. It says, preach the word, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that's what the reprobate does. He's heard the truth, turns away from the truth and believes a lie, believes a fable. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So one verse is talking about reprobates, the next verse is saying, be, um, be an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. Because in the light of the, the reprobate doctrine, we just need to preach the gospel more and more so we can get to these people before they become reprobates. That's why the answer to the reprobate doctrine is preaching the gospel. And that's why in the book of Nahum also you see the exhortation to behold the preaching of the good news. So we need to be more diligent to keep on preaching the gospel. And my last point I want to look at today is that God is a stronghold to us in the day of trouble and that he knows our name. He knows our name. I can find my, there it is there. In Nahum chapter 1 verse 7, if you can turn there, Nahum chapter 1 verse 7, <clears throat> says there, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. He knoweth them that trust in him. So the day of trouble, I believe here what we have here is a foreshadow or a picture of the rapture. Because ultimately the day of the Lord is going to be a day of trouble for the whole world that they don't believe, they haven't believed in Jesus. It's going to be a day of trouble. But in that day of trouble, the Lord's going to be our stronghold because we're going to be caught up with him in, in the air. And what, a, a, what, what better stronghold can you have than being with the Lord Jesus Christ? And he's going to do that. He, he's going to know which ones to take because he knoweth them that trust in him. Those that are trusting in him to be, as their stronghold, he knows them and he will save you from the day of trouble. But not just at the rapture, but day to day, whenever you have the day of trouble in this life, he's still your stronghold. You can still go to him in faith and find that he is your stronghold. 
And have a look at Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. And this is a great verse which talks about how God knows us. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says there, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. So if you're saved today, you've been redeemed. You're one of these ones that have been redeemed, and he says to you, I've called you by your name, thou art mine. Isn't that comforting to, comforting to know that you're God's? If you're redeemed, he knows you by name, you're his, and he's going to look after you. And verse 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So we have a great promise from, from, from the Lord that he knows you and he's going to protect you in the day of trouble. So that's about all I had for you today. I wanted to keep it at, at half an hour since we've had a big day already. So I just want to re remind us of, of Nineveh that Nineveh was a city that turned away from the, from the word of God and had become a rejected city by God that he did not want to try and send anyone else to them. He was just going to punish them for their wicked sins and they had become God's enemy. And uh, we need to realise also that God is slow to anger. He's very merciful to us. And in light of their reprobate doctrine, we just need to keep preaching the gospel faithfully day in, day out. And that, that's how we can get to these people before it's too late.